Before I formally begin this brief series of lectures, uh, there are a couple of things that I want to say to all of you. In the first place, I recognize that in the audience this evening we have physicians, we have hospital staff and administration, we have distinguished clergy who are present, and in a gathering of people of that sort, usually it's uh, customary for a speaker to uh, make his address in a very abstract and academic way. But I want to ask your indulgence, if I may, to clarify that I'm directing these lectures to patients, first of all, and second of all, to friends and to families of those people who have had to face firsthand profound levels of pain, of uncertainty, of suffering, and in many cases, death itself. And the other thing I want to say by way of preface is that as I address these very difficult matters, I'm not going to be speaking as a physician or as a psychologist or as a philosopher, as even Dr. Lemaitre intimated, but I will be speaking from a dual perspective, first as a theologian, but more importantly as a human being because the problem of suffering is something that immediately takes us out of the realm of the abstract and touches us at the point where we are human. And whenever I encounter this question of suffering, either as a philosophical question or as a cry of pain from somebody who's in the midst of that suffering when they're asking it, the question that I hear in my profession inevitably is the question, where is God in all of this? And then the next question is the question that is the one that every theologian dreads to hear. It's this question, why? When I'm afflicted, when you're afflicted, when pain intrudes into your life and the threat of death comes, the first thing that we ask is, why? Why me? Why has this happened? How could God allow these things to take place? Now, anytime we ask this simple question, why, we're asking a question about purpose. The why questions are the questions about purpose. The why questions are the questions about meaning. We're not asking how, we're not asking when, we're not asking what, we're asking why. And I think there's a reason why we ask the question. It's one thing to experience pain, but it's another thing to anticipate that my suffering and my pain is worthless. If I'm going to have to go through pain, if I'm going to have to go through suffering, I have to know inside of myself that there's some kind of reason for this, that it's not just an exercise in futility. This came home to me very vividly and very personally just a few weeks ago. My wife Vesta and I had returned to Orlando after being on the road and had been speaking at, uh, I don't even remember where we were, but any time that we're away from home, and come back home. It's, a, it's an experience of great joy. I remember as we drove uh, into our driveway, I said to my wife, I said, we're home. It's wonderful. We pulled into the driveway, into the garage, and as I shut the engine of the car off and got out of the car, came around behind the car, the door to our kitchen opened and my daughter framed the doorway. And as soon as she saw us, she burst into tears. And she blurted out these words, Daddy, I just lost my baby. And she came over to me, and I just held out my arms, and she grabbed me, and I held her while she sobbed in my shoulder. And it took a few moments for her to, to get over the trauma of seeing us on our return and, and to explain what had happened here. She had just begun her ninth month of her pregnancy, 
pregnancy that had been very difficult, that had been one that involved a, a long period of morning sickness and some difficulties with hemorrhaging and so on. But she had just that day felt the absence of life within her. And she had gone to see her doctor, and the doctor had gone and put her through many tests and announced to her soberly and sadly that the baby had died. Well, of course, that's, that's always a very difficult thing for any expectant mother to experience. But on top of that, the doctor then explained that the procedure that was necessary for her to follow would be this, that they would bring her into the hospital the next morning and induce labor. And we talked about it. And she said, Daddy, they want me to go through labor, but my baby's dead. I've often stood in profound admiration at the strength of women to go through the travail of childbirth. And I've often wondered, after they've gone through it once, how they could uh, make the decision to do it again, or in many cases, again and again. And as I speak to women about this, I say, how can you stand to go through this process that we call euphemistically labor? And they say, because of what we know is waiting at the end of the pain. That is, a woman is willing to endure the pain uh, of childbirth because she looks forward to the moment that a life will be produced. And once that life is there and she holds her baby for the first time, then th the pain is, is, is behind her, and it, for that moment at least, she says, it's worth it and I'll do it again. But how do you go into the hospital to go through childbirth and labor knowing that what's at the end of your pain is death? And that's what my daughter and I had to talk about. And she, she looked at me as a theologian and not just as a father, and she wanted to get some heavy answers to her question, and frankly, I didn't have any. And so we went to the hospital the next day, her husband and her mother and I, and she checked in. They induced the labor. We sat there in the delivery room with her, timed the contractions, and, and she was being uh, heroic, I thought. I was very proud of her. And after several hours had passed, she said, Daddy, why don't you go down and, uh, and get some lunch and come back in a little while because I'm doing fine. And so I excused myself. I was glad to, for the respite. I went downstairs and, and ordered a brief lunch. It only took 15 or 20 minutes and hurried back up to the floor uh, to carry on the vigil. And as I approached the swinging doors that went under the ward, suddenly I was stopped by the sound of a blood-curdling scream. And it took a couple of moments for it to sink in that it was my daughter that was screaming like that. And, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was terrified to go through those doors and go back in the room. And as I approached the room, this nurse stopped me. She held her hands up and she said, the baby's coming. And so I scurried back into the outer corridor for a few moments. And then she finally came out and she said, OK, you can go in now. And so I went in. And I saw something that uh, I will never forget, my wife will never forget, my son-in-law will never forget, and I know my daughter will never forget as long as I live. My daughter was in the bed, and she was holding to her bosom an eight-month-old little girl who had no life. And I wondered about the medical procedure, the policy. Why in the world would they leave this dead baby in the arms of a mother? Why didn't they just snatch it away and dispose of it however they do? And, and as I uh, discussed that with the nurses, they said, the mother needs to see the fruit of her labor. So she held the baby for 45 minutes, for an hour. They came in, they took pictures, a lock of hair, gave her a name, and did all of these things. And 
My daughter cried, and I cried, and her husband cried, and everybody cried. But as we've spoken of it now in the last several weeks, she said, Daddy, I had to hold my baby because I had to know that my labor was not in vain, that my pain was not in vain. Just this Monday, I received word in my office that the wife of a rather famous sports figure in America passed away. Bob Greasy, the all-pro former quarterback of the Miami Dolphins, his wife, young wife, Judy, died this week after battling cancer for 10 years. Now, I'm not a, a, a close personal friend of the Greasy family, but I was in Miami a month ago, and I was doing a series of lectures, and after one of these lectures, a woman came up to me, pressed through the people, and came up to me, and she said, R.C., she said, I'm asking you to do a personal favor for me. And I said, what's that? She said, I have a dear friend who's been fighting cancer for 10 years, and she's really down right now. And she went on to tell me something of Judy Greasy's story. And she said, Judy's been listening to your tapes and all, and she knows you, not personally, but, but through these uh, educational materials. And she said, I'm just sure it'll mean a lot to her if you would somehow find a time to go and see her. And I said, sure, I'll go. And I'll be honest with you, I, don't, I can't remember feeling more inadequate than when I got in that car to go and visit a woman who had been battling this disease for 10 years. And we drove into this very lovely section of Miami, and I saw the greasy home. And the greasy home is a very nice home. And, and the irony was that right across the street was the home of the Bonacani family. And you'll remember, those of you who follow professional sports know that Nick Bonacani was an all-pro uh, linebacker from Miami. And he's been much in the news for the last couple of years because his son, who was a very talented athlete, was paralyzed in an injury and has become a paraplegic. And so a pall of suffering was hanging over these neighbors, over these longtime friends. Well, this lady took me up to the house. We rang the doorbell, and Bob answered the door, and he took me into the family room, and Judy was sitting back there in a chair. And I came in, and I sat down next to her in the chair, and, and, dear friends, I had no idea what to say to her. And she looked at me, and the tears started to just roll down over her cheeks. And she, and she said, R.C., I don't think I can take it anymore. I didn't know what to say. I mean, what do you say? Do you say, well, don't talk like that, or do you say, you have to keep hanging in there, you have to keep this? And I thought, who am I to tell this woman how much she has to take? So I didn't say anything. I just held her hand. And I sat there feeling more and more and more inadequate by the moment as I held her hand for about 45 minutes and just listened to her talk. And when we were finished, we had some prayer, and I left. The next day, I got the report that she fell down the stairs and was carried into the hospital, and she never came home from the hospital. It was basically the end. But this woman came to me the next day, and she was all excited, and she said, oh, she said, you just can't believe how wonderful it was last night when you visited Judy Greasy. And I said, I didn't say anything. <laughs> I, said, I said, I was so embarrassed. I said, I know she was looking to me to give her some words of comfort and of wisdom and to explain the secret counsel of Almighty God, which I'm not equipped to do no matter how much theology I've studied. And I said, I didn't do anything. All I did was sit there and hold her hand. 
for 45 minutes. And she said, but that's all she wanted. And that's all she needed. She's heard all the sermons, and she's heard all the platitudes, but she just wanted somebody to show her that they cared. And she said, whether you like it or not, because you're a minister, you represent the presence of Christ to her. I said, wait, hey, <laughs> it's a poor representation. And I thought at that moment of a statement that Martin Luther once made. He said, it's the duty of every Christian to be Christ to his neighbor. Now, Luther was too fine of a theologian to mean that statement in a literal word. Martin Luther understood that no one of us can ever fill the shoes of Christ. But to be a Christian means to represent him, to bring his comfort, his peace, his understanding, and not his judgment to people who are in pain. I don't very often get the opportunity to, to listen to the televangelist, that's the new word that's been coined this year, the TV preachers, but I did hear not too long ago, I heard one of these preachers, I couldn't even remember at the moment who it was, but he was standing up and he, he made this statement to the people out there in television land. He said, I want you people to understand that God has nothing whatsoever to do with suffering, and that God, God doesn't have anything to do with death. Death is, is something that intrudes into the creation of God. And then, of course, this minister went on to say and to assign all pain and all suffering and all illness and all death to the devil. And as I listened to that, to be honest with you, I wanted to throw something through the TV screen. Now, I, I, tried, I tried to understand what would possess a minister, whether he's a television minister or any other kind of minister, to stand up and tell people that God doesn't have anything to do with suffering or that God doesn't have anything to do with death. And the only thing I could come up with was that this minister somehow wanted to answer the problems that people have when suffering comes upon them because some people get mad at God. Some, a lot of people get mad at God. They say, hey, you know, this isn't fair. How can you uh, let, the, let this sort of thing happen to me? Again, why? Where is God in all of this? And what the minister on television was trying to do so carefully was to absolve God from all guilt and all responsibility for ever allowing anything unpleasant to befall one of his dear creatures. Just like the philosophers used to say that if God is really loving and if God is really powerful, then he couldn't possibly allow all of the tragedy and the pain and the suffering and the sorrow that happens in this world to happen. And so the minister on television neatly tied it up in a package for us and said, God simply doesn't have anything to do with it. Now, I'm sure that what he was trying to do was to make people feel comfortable because they couldn't, didn't want to have to think about a God who might, in fact, be involved with their pain. But two things jumped into my mind at that point. The first thing, I thought, I wonder if this man has ever read the Old Testament. I wonder if this man's ever read the New Testament. Because the God of Judaism, the God of Christianity, is a God who majors in suffering. The whole history of Israel is the history of the sorrow and the pain of a people who were in a special relationship to God. In fact, how did the Jewish nation begin? You remember your history. It began when a, a group of semi-nomadic people were pressed into slavery. And you've all heard of the exodus 
out of which a nation was formed under the authority of God. How did it happen? The biblical record said this, that when the people of Israel were locked in bondage in Egypt, they began to cry. They began to groan. They began to express their pain, and we read these words, and God heard the cries of His people. And God said, let my people go. That's how it all started. And from that moment forth, we see a history of a deity who is intimately involved in the pain and in the suffering of His people. It's not by accident, ladies and gentlemen, that in the New Testament, Jesus is identified as a man of sorrows who is acquainted with grief, and He is called the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah's future expectation of one who would be known as the suffering servant of Israel. So far from the idea that God does anything to do with death or God does anything to do with suffering is the Scripture is that God is the Lord of life. He's the Lord of death. He's the Lord of pain. He's the Lord of suffering. And rather than that being bad news to me, that's good news because the simplest of all theological lessons that we can learn from this is that if there is a God who is sovereign over all of life, over all of death, and over all pain, and over all disease, and over all illness, and over all sorrow, then what that means is that it is flat out impossible that any pain could ever be without purpose. If God is, then there is no such thing as meaningless suffering. I don't know what the individual suffering means or why a particular person is called to suffer in a particular way at a particular time. I don't know. I cannot read the mind of God, the secret counsel of God, but I do know something about the character of God. And I know that He is sovereign. And it's when pain comes and when disease comes that sovereignty suddenly becomes more than an abstraction, doesn't it? Because that's where the struggle is. Can I trust God in this or not? Now, I was talking with one of the members of the staff here of MD Anderson about problems that people experience when they are afflicted with cancer. And when the diagnosis is first made, there are all kinds of of human emotions that are expressed. There's anger, there's fear, but one of the stronger emotions is surprise because we like to think that these kinds of diseases and this kind of suffering can never or will never come into our lives. And that surprise becomes all the more accentuated when we hear ministers out there telling us that, uh, you know, if you believe in God and you believe in Christ, you never have to worry about pain and suffering. That's just not true. That does not comfort us when we need to be comforted. The shock of, of pain and disease changes. I, I, I have a little grandson that's uh, three years old, and uh, he's, you know how kids are, they're so uh, oblivious to all of the, the sorrow that's, that's in the world. And they're enjoying life, and, but then all of a sudden they, they bang their, their fingers with a hammer, or, or they fall down and they scrape their knees, and, and this little one will come in and he's crying crocodile tears, and, and I'll say, what's the matter, Ryan? He says, I have an ouch. And I say, well, uh, what can I do? Or he says, well, I want a, an aid band. 
or he says he wants me to kiss it because if I kiss it, then the ouch will go away and it'll be all over. And that's the way a lot of the pain and sickness and disease in children turns out, not for everyone. We can go here to the pediatric ward at MD Anderson and see children whose illnesses cannot be kissed away. But for most people, our childhood diseases are over as quickly and as suddenly as they came upon us. And we sort of distance ourselves from more serious pain. Remember when I took our daughter in to have her tonsils out and, and oh, what a wonderful experience. You know, you're know, you gonna go to see the doctor. And we read all the books and, uh, and, uh, and promised her all the toys and presents. You're gonna have ice cream. You're gonna have all these wonderful things. And she came in the pediatric ward in Pittsburgh and, and they gave her the toys to play with and a nice, uh, pleasant roommate and so on. Both these little girls were playing, getting ready the night before. Next morning, early in the morning, they took the girls up give them their tonsillectomies, and, and then we waited in the waiting room, and finally we were called to come in, and I came into that room, and my daughter looked at me, I'll never forget how she looked at me, <laughs> like I had, had given her the worst betrayal that was possible. I mean, the last thing in the world she wanted at that moment was ice cream. <laughs> her throat hurt so much she didn't want to have anything in her throat at that point, and she looked at me like, how could you? fool me into this. This was her first taste of real pain, the hard kind. But as we grow older, then when we have indigestion, we're not sure it's indigestion. When we have a headache, we're not sure it's a headache. Now, the life-threatening diseases become clear and present dangers. And for some, they hear the announcement that their disease may be terminal. And at that moment, the surprise hits. Even though we've spent our lives being prepared for this possibility, it is still a surprise. And theologically, it's the worst surprise because we're still forced back to this question, why, how could God allow this to happen? And that's why I just, for this first segment, I want to leave you with one statement from the New Testament that I think puts it in perspective. When St. Peter wrote to his people, don't, you don't need to look this up, in, in the first epistle of Peter, in the fourth chapter, he makes this statement, Dear friends, think it not strange that you are suffering a painful trial, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Isn't that interesting? Think it not strange. That's because by this point in his life, Peter understood that God was intimately involved with suffering and that for a person to be called upon to suffer is not surprising once we understand who God is. Now in our next segment, what I want to explore with you is this, an idea that maybe you've never thought of, maybe you have. I want to explore the idea that not only God is involved in our suffering and that God may be with us in our suffering, but there may be times when God actually calls us to suffer. That suffering and at times death can be the vocation of a human being. Now, that may seem strange to you, but I want to explore that as we look at a case study in vocational suffering in our next meeting together. In this first session, we looked at the very difficult question of how do we relate to people who are undergoing serious suffering, the person who has been diagnosed perhaps as having a terminal illness or uh, the situation where we, we get the word that a, 
a, a horrible tragedy has befallen a friend or a family member, perhaps an automobile accident or whatever. And in, in this first session, I confess to you uh, my own sense of inadequacy on, uh, on having a formula to say exactly uh, the right thing at a time like that. In fact, some of you must be thinking, well, this man is a minister and he's a theologian. Certainly he can come up with more than uh, simply just going and, and listening uh, to someone or being with them in their presence. Uh, when I had the experience of, of writing my first novel, Johnny Come Home, I received a lot of, uh, of letters. Some of them were very, very negative and critical about that novel. And the, the biggest criticism that I received were people writing in to say to me they were disappointed that the, uh, the minister in the, uh, the novel didn't uh, preach a, a, a sermon to uh, one of the characters in the book. And as I, as I read those letters and thought about it, I thought, Gee, these people don't really understand what the purpose of a novel is. They expected a, an evangelistic tract or a sermon, and they didn't get what they were expecting. And I suspect that maybe uh, you're expecting for me to hear uh, a more uh, structured uh, formula for speaking to people who are bereaved or who are struggling with the difficult questions of suffering. But I think it really is important that we don't have a, uh, a pat formula to use in these circumstances. In the New Testament, Jesus promises us that He will send into our midst the Holy Spirit who is our comforter. Now, of course, the, the original intent of that uh, statement of Jesus was to, to send one who would stand with us in the time of trial and the time of tribulation to be our defender. But also, he tells us that there is a comfort that God promises to give people in this world. Now, sometimes the way in which God brings comfort to His people is through us. Luther once made the statement that every Christian is called to be Christ for his neighbor. Now, obviously, Luther didn't mean that in a in a crass sense where I'm supposed to be uh, acting like a Messiah and think that I'm the Savior of the world, but rather that I am to, to be the presence of Christ to those who are in pain and to those who are frightened by uh, being a vehicle or a conduit of His comfort. Now, what I'd like you to do as you're studying these tapes, and perhaps right now, uh, if you have a, an opportunity for group discussion, is to, is to deal with two questions. The first question is this. Suppose you were called to the scene of a Judy Greasy or to a home where uh, the word had just come that the, a family member had been killed in a tragic accident, and it was somebody that you knew and somebody that you cared for. First of all, how would you feel about speaking to the family at that time, and what do you think you would say? I'd like you to, to think about that, and if you're in a group, to discuss that among yourselves to see how, how the different uh, ways uh, we would respond to such a situation might be. The second question I'd like you to discuss is a little bit more personal. If you can imagine yourself in a situation of serious pain, and suffering. And one of your friends or your minister came to visit you. What would you want them to do or to say? I mean, I can imagine some of you may, may say to yourself, well, gee, if, or see, if you came to see me and, and I was dying of cancer and you said nothing but just simply sat there and held my hand and listened to me, I would be disappointed. I would be let down because I would be looking to you to say something more, to give me some kind of hope or encouragement with your words. Well, let me ask you to try to imagine that situation now and discuss it among yourselves, saying, what would you want your friend or your pastor to say? So that we can express these things with each other and learn
how to be sensitive to other people who face this difficulty.